The year 2022 marks the 40th anniversary of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and this milestone provides an ideal opportunity to reflect on the meaning and importance of this vitally important part of our constitutional law. And so in this project, we wanted to bring together a group of scholars and jurists to reflect on what is arguably the most important provision of the Charter, what is arguably the linchpin of the Charter. And that provision is Section 1 of the Charter, which both guarantees the rights and freedoms set out in the Charter, but also says that these rights and freedoms can be limited. Section 1 of the Charter states as follows. The Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees the rights and freedoms set out in it, subject only to such reasonable limits prescribed by law as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. And what Section 1 offers is a general statement about the guarantees and the limits to the rights that are guaranteed in the Charter. That's different than the American Constitution where there's no general provision about how to justify limitations to different rights protected in their Bill of Rights. So there's this question that's in the background then is, should this one statement about limiting rights in the Canadian Constitution be interpreted and applied differently when there are different rights that have been infringed? by some kind of government legislation or government action. And I think that's kind of what we're here to discuss today, that there are, you know, there's obviously limits to all of this. We're never gonna have it perfect, but how do we do it kind of in the best way that we can, preserving rights as much as possible? The question of limits is very important. And I think one of the great benefits of this conference is thinking of new ways uh, that may be different to think about how to implement this, this issue of limitations in constitutional adjudication. In bringing scholars and lawyers and law students from across Canada here to the University of British Columbia, we wanted to ask, 40 years after the Charter arrived, is there anything about our approach to Section 1 that we need to re-examine? One of the reasons we really wanted to examine Section 1 is because of the importance of the rights that it guarantees and potentially allows to be limited. Rights such as the right to equality, the right to life, liberty, and security of the person. Freedoms which the Charter describes as fundamental, which protect our ability to express our core beliefs or share our ideas with others, such as freedom of expression, freedom of religion, and freedom of conscience. Expressive freedom is the kind of guarantee that we can all get on side with in the abstract. You could speak to speak to anyone and no one's going to say that they don't support freedom of expression but when it gets put into context it's very easy to support placing limits on or even censoring expressive activity that we don't like that we consider objectionable offensive those who hold quote unquote mainstream views who are on side with majoritarian values and so on, they don't need the protection of freedom of expression because nobody's going to try to interfere with their, their rights. Nobody's going to try to interfere with their freedoms, generally speaking. So freedom of expression, paradoxically, is for those that we object to the most. And that's why it's a difficult guarantee. So the core of my research paper is around the relationship between Section 15, that is the Equality Rights Provision, and Section 1. Um, and this is, follows on through decades of debate about whether or not courts are in, inappropriately importing Section 1 considerations into Section 15. And so with my paper, I hope to provide a little bit of analytic clarity to the debate and uh, a resolution of it. What's ultimately important is that it be an approach that's guided in principled ways, that values the rights that each person has, that, that each group has, um, and that finds a way to read them in a way reconciled with the rights and interests of, uh, of other people and other groups at the same time. We are granting rights to everyone, we're guaranteeing the rights of everyone, and they're going to come into conflict. And so um, the, the basis of living in a free and democratic society is the, the struggle and the tension to balance competing rights. I think that what we're committed to is part of a democratic society where we treat everyone as equal and as a valuable participant, um, no one's above anyone else, it means that we have to guarantee certain rights for everyone. And certain people, uh, maybe part of certain groups, have certain characteristics that require us to take a serious look at what a rights-protecting regime looks like. 
If there's one fundamental value that pretty much every Canadian shares, right? We may we may disagree about the, the scope of rights, the content of rights, the interpretation of rights, but we all basically agree on the fundamental importance of rights. So taking section one seriously means not just thinking about rights limitations, it also means thinking about what does it actually mean then to guarantee rights if we're talking about limitations in the context of rights guarantees. And some of these terms, uh, like a free and democratic society, as one of the papers uh, for the panel says, are, are what people say are essentially contested concepts. They, they have uh, a meaning that is complex enough that, that we just have not been able and probably will never be able to arrive at a specific definition. We ought to start by asking how do we frame constitutional questions and how do we go beyond the usual way of looking at a case, what are the claims that the parties are making, what are the decisions that judges have made, and start looking much, much deeper at what is the nature of a constitutional concept and what is the nature of a constitutional text and how does it relate to the other aspects of our legal and political uh, existence. The text of section one refers to uh, limits in accordance with demonstrable justification and what I think demonstrable justification means is that the government has to show in reasons in its legislation or an administrator has to show through reasons that uh, it has seriously looked at other alternatives for achieving its legislative goals. It can't just say uh, we believe in our judgment that this is the best way to balance the rights at issue. It has to show that it considered other alternatives and show that those alternatives were not as good. That justification is the only way that we can make sure that a right was limited in accordance with the charter itself. The papers presented at the symposium will be published in the Supreme Court Law Review and in a special collection by LexisNexis in 2023. We're really excited about this publication and so grateful for the many contributors and participants who joined us in this important discussion. But most importantly, we want this to be a resource, not just for lawyers or judges, but for all Canadians whose rights and freedoms and lives can be profoundly impacted by the interpretation and application of Section 1. It was a, a, an excellent uh, program, uh, a, a lot of uh, diverse uh, topics and uh, uh, speakers. It's interesting as the next judge to participate in this kind of thing because uh, the, uh, the academics uh, treat a word coming from the courts as uh, uh, bolts from uh, the mountain. But in fact, the courts are just as interested in, in what uh, the participants at a conference like this say as uh, they are interested in what the judges say. There's a constant kind of biofeedback of new ideas uh, uh, coming up uh, to the courts. Uh, these sessions are really valuable and uh, this one in particular was extremely well done.